thank you everyone for being here. And um, I just want to say, there we go, introduce myself. I was a little bit introduced before, but it was all in Swedish, so I wasn't sure when you were laughing if it was about me or with me. But in any event, I've um, been a food and drug lawyer for maybe 33, 34 years. And I'm the president of the National Health Federation, which is just celebrating this year its 60th anniversary. We've been around longer than Codex. We've been around longer than some countries. And um, I write a column, a legal column, for a magazine in the US called Whole Foods Magazine. I also am the editor of our magazine, which some of you have gotten from the back. And if you're one of our international members, then you'll get this mailed to you regularly. And I've been attending Codex meetings for, this is my 16th year that I've been doing it. And I'm a big fan of Sarah and Marina, so that's uh, me. But this is you. This is you. Well informed. <laughs> well, it's actually Alma, but it's on a bad day. And open-minded. You're freedom-oriented or you wouldn't be here. Obviously, you're health-oriented or you wouldn't be here. But you're a little angry, a little concerned, and you see what's going on. And one of the things that's going on is this. Look at this. You know, in the during economic expansions, you see, <coughs> you see the little dark band there. That's 90% of the population, and this is the 10 percenters. Well, with each expansion, it's shared and distributed mostly amongst the 90 percenters. But since 1982, where has most of that growth and money been going? It's been going into the hands of the power elite, not into us. It's not spread evenly around, but it's going into the elite who really run Sweden, who really run America, who really run Canada, who really run Britain, who really run just about everything. So what's our goal here? Our goal here is to stop that as much as we can. And in particular, we, we are focusing on, and am I speaking clearly enough? Because I know my Swedish really sucks. So <laughs> I, I, you know, I, can, I know what ok means, and that's about it. And I can say talk and, you know. Just I just, oh, okay. Just go on. So, but if there's a part that I get to that's not clear, then please raise your hand and I'll try to explain it. In any event, there are various food supplement directives in the EU and the European Union and uh, that are affecting you, that are limiting your rights, especially here in Sweden, because before, relative to the rest of the countries in the European Union, you had a lot of health rights. You, Great Britain, Ireland, and the Netherlands. You were at the top of the list. At the bottom of the list of freedom, loving countries was Germany and France. Well, you've come down about 90%. They've come up about 10% in this harmonized, great, glorious, we are the world, European Union. So you've lost a lot that you used to have. And I can even remember my first trip to Sweden and there were a lot more, uh, there was a lot more opportunity to get things that you needed here at a reasonable price than there are now, now that you're part of the European Union. But also, this is all part of the Codex Alimentarius process. So, why is this important? Now, how many of you have heard me speak before? If I could just, so it helps me tailor. Well, I know those two in the back have heard every speech, so let's see. Okay, so not that many. So this is, this is one of my favorite charts, and I absolutely don't expect you to read it because I'm having trouble. Well, no, I can read it from here. But this is a chart that's your relative, and it's probably the most important thing I'll show you today, and because it sets the tone for everything else. This is the relative risk of dying, uh, or the risk of dying relative to being killed on a Boeing 747 flight. So right here is, if, is one. That's the mean. And up here is your highest risk of dying. And guess what that is? That's going to a hospital. That's taking a, a properly approved drug by the government. That's uh, being seen by a properly licensed medical doctor. That is actually your highest risk up there. And then over here, you know, flying an ultralight aircraft, there are, you know, school bus accidents, you know, snowmobiles, things like that. But your biggest risk up here is all this 
risk from hospitals, doctors, and drugs. And then down here, what's your lowest risk? Well, you're walking back to your car here in La Home, and you hear a noise, and you look up, and suddenly there's this, like, meteorite streaking out of the sky, and it hits you on the head, and, you know, you fall to the ground, lights out. That's your lowest risk. You know, that's not going to happen. You're all going to get home safely. But what's your next lowest risk? Well, I'm going to skip that. What's your third to lowest risk? You're out enjoying the weather here, and the wind has died down enough that there are bees, and the bee stings you and you die. That's the third lowest risk. The fourth lowest risk is you're doing the same thing, but instead of a bee, a lightning bolt comes out of the sky and hits you, and you're dead. So you're wondering what's the second lowest risk, right? What's the second lowest risk? Uh, it is taking vitamins and mineral supplements, taking natural health care. That's ranked somewhere in your risk of dying between being stung by a bee and being hit by that meteorite streaking out of the sky. So what do these morons do in the government? They have convinced everyone how deadly dangerous natural health care is, how vitamin and mineral supplements are just absolutely fatal. And so they are trying to convince each and every one of you, and certainly your uh, countrymen and countrywomen, that this is a horrible thing and it needs to be controlled. But now these are figures from the United States, but you can take them on a pro rata basis and they apply to, to Sweden. But 800,000 deaths a year in America from doctors, 120,000 deaths a year from properly prescribed drugs, 5,000 deaths a year from food, just eating food. And in the last uh, 35 years, and these are U.S. government statistics, do you want to know how many deaths from taking vitamin and mineral supplements? Now, notice I say vitamin and mineral supplements. I'm not saying herbs. I'm not saying amino acids. I'm saying vitamin and minerals. For according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, in the last 35 years, there's been a big fat zero number of deaths from vitamin and mineral supplements. They did try to get one guy had a bottle in his pocket and he was crossing the street and he got hit by a lorry by a truck and he was killed and they tried to blame it on the vitamins but it didn't work <laughs> so you know that that didn't work so it didn't make it into the statistics but they do try you know like they're taking all these drugs and then they go in oh you're taking vitamin c obviously that caused your heart attack yes that's it well that's how they do it but what really what they want to keep you from are all these things that actually will cure you. So how many people here know about GCMAF? Well, yeah, I know you know, and I know that Sylvia knows, and let's see, some other, one, some one person raised her hand. GCMAF, I usually give a presentation on it, but I don't have time. It's a macrophage activating factor, and it kills cancer dead. And there's a company in the uh, Channel Islands that is selling it, but it's being persecuted by the British government because it has a very effective treatment for cancer. You give a, in a diabetic gauge needle, a uh, once weekly injection, and it takes care of prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, slick as a whistle. Do they have that expression here? Slick as a whistle. It's very easy. It's not, and it's much cheaper than conventional therapy, but because it works so well, they're going after it because it's competition with the huge multi-billion kroner industry of typical chemotherapy and cancer treatment. And uh, on our website, we do have some articles about, about GCMAF, but it's a glycoprotein, and it basically is like calling in the cal cavalry to come in and reinforce your natural killer cells, your first responders, because the cancer cells, they exude this little enzyme called nagalase that inactivates uh, your um, first immune, you have two immune systems and it inactivates the first one. And so GCMAF acts like reinforcements that then overwhelms the nagalase, overwhelms the cancer cells and kills it dead. But there are all sorts of other things that help with that, like selenium, taking selenium. There's an article on the Ebola virus there on the, one of our, on the table about um, one of our issues of the magazine. And really, when you get to the heart of it, it's a selenium deficiency. They found that those people who have adequate levels of selenium are far less susceptible to the Ebola virus, vitamin C and selenium. 
vitamin K, uh, D for cancer. Women who are on adequate levels of vitamin D, I think is about 2,000 international units a day, but I myself recommend taking 5,000. They uh, have a marked reduction in the risk for breast cancer, and men a marked reduction in the risk for uh, prostate cancer. And then vitamin K2 for stronger bones and teeth. And uh, we'll just move on because there's a lot. But the vitamin D3, did I go one too soon? No. Uh, vitamin D3, this just kind of shows you if you can get your concentrations of vitamin D up in your bloodstream, your risk of d dying from any sort of disease is lowered. It doesn't matter what the disease is. And uh, here, when you have a low concentration of just 3.5 to 13, they found the deaths were like 39 out of 379. Well, let's just skip up here. It's say you get it up to 45 nanograms per milliliter, then the risk of dying, look, they're only 17 out of 379. A lot of people I know who are in our business, they have levels up to 80 nanograms. And if you go into your per uh, milliliter, and if you go to your doctor, he or she will say, gosh, that's too much. Vitamin D toxicity, drop, stop, whatever you're doing. But in effect, you're actually making yourself very, very much stronger. And the reason is, here we are in La Home. So where is La Home in the grand scheme of things? It's at the 56 and a half uh, degree latitude. You're really far up from the equator. So what does that mean? You look at the atmosphere, and if you're at the equator, how come the rates of cancer are lower there? How come the rates of multiple sclerosis, high blood pressure, all these sort of diseases are lower at the equator? Because the vitamin D producing rays go through this much atmosphere. But up here, La Home, it has to punch through almost twice as much. Really, actually, it is twice as much. And anywhere above the 33rd para, uh, latitude, you have problems getting vitamin D. That's why, if you ever thought about it, why does the flu season occur in February? It's because in July, you're out in the sun, you don't have much covering your skin, and you're getting a lot of vitamin D. And if you're pale like I am, uh, then you're getting a lot more. Uh, the darker the skin, the more protective it is, but also the more it blocks vitamin D production in your skin. So you build up a lot, it's stored in your liver, and then uh, so in La Home, your prime time for getting vitamin D produ production in your skin is July and about two weeks either side of July. That's it. I don't care if it's December and it's a sunny day and you go out nu completely nude, you're probably not going to get any vitamin D because all of it's blocked going through the atmosphere. But in July, you get some. And then by September, your liver stores are lower. October, lower still. November, very low. December, gone. January, definitely gone. And then what happens? You have no protection against viruses because vitamin D hypes up your immune system and makes it much stronger. Actually, it makes it smarter, not stronger, but makes it better able to react to viruses and attack them and to cancer and the like. So it's hard to get uh, vitamin D. And in any way other than in supplements. So it, I, I, I don't sell supplements. I don't make a penny off of it. But if I were living anywhere above the 33rd latitude, I would be, outside of the summertime, I'd be taking vitamin D supplements. And um, uh, any of your friends, you should tell them to do that. And you'll notice a difference. Their depression levels will be uh, lowered, their, uh, their sort of joy of life will be raised as well as being healthier. But there's also a problem with the calcium paradox, and that is why do, you know, all these countries that eat a lot of dairy products, but yet it's still not getting into the bones. And we could spend the whole time just talking about that. You know, one of the reasons that, um, uh, how do I put it? Well, one of the reasons that women in their menopause period start having osteoporosis at a greater rate than men is because estrogen, which they've been manufacturing in abundance beforehand, is a great fixer of calcium in the bones. Uh, it's a tremendous fixer of calcium in the bones and the teeth, making them hard. But once that production stops, then it, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. So what can you do? Well, you take magnesium, because that helps pull the 
the calcium out of the soft tissue where you don't want it and put it in your hard tissue. And you want vitamin D3, surprise, and you want boron, and you want vitamin K2. All of those work together to make your bones and your teeth really strong. What people make a mistake on is they'll take a lot of calcium because that's what the doctors told them to do. But calcium's the worst thing you can do because it's sort of like pouring gasoline on a fire because the calcium without, think of magnesium as the traffic cop. It tells the calcium where to go as does the vitamin K2, but without adequate levels of magnesium, you're just going to have it accumulate in your arteries where it will cause heart attacks. It will uh, accumulate in your skin where it causes wrinkles. You know, when you and I were born, of the twin minerals, calcium, magnesium, our skin, you know, that baby skin like Alma has back there that's so perfectly smooth, that's 95% magnesium, 5% calcium. By the time she's 70 years old, although she'll live a lot longer than that, it'll be the exact opposite if she's not following her parents' advice. It'll be 95% calcium, 5% magnesium, and have wrinkles. And so you need magnesium to direct, it's the traffic cop, to direct it where you want it to go. And uh, there's a really great woman named, uh, French-Canadian, uh, Quebecois named Kate Rombleu, who's written a book called Calcium Paradox, the calcium paradox in vitamin K2. And she points out how K2 is a very key player in all of this. But the reason I'm mentioning this, and it really doesn't concern codex directly, but is just to show you that there are all these things that play into how one can be healthy. But it shows the ignorance at codex, at the government level, even at your medical doctor level, of how to prevent these problems from happening in the first place. So here you have heart disease. Now, um, it's really caused by calcification of the arteries. And I noticed one of the earlier speakers was talking about the cholesterol myth. I forget who said it, but it might have been Michael or Sarah. Yeah, it was Sarah. And, um, and it's absolutely right what she said. Whatever she said, I agreed with, although I didn't understand it. But I saw cholesterol myth up there. And... Uh, and it really isn't about that. It's about calcification of the arteries. So you want to keep them clean. And you have to be careful. My own father was killed by calcium. He was only 44 and a half years old. And he had a heart attack. His arteries were, were clear, but he had a calcium flap that was there on the surface. And it flapped up, and it blocked the heart flow, and it killed him. Killed him dead. Uh, so... The, here's just an example. If you have sufficient vitamin K, and not K1, but K2, then you won't have calcium deposited in your, in your arteries. And the calcium, when it's deposited in your arteries, it makes it stiff and hard. You don't want that. And here's K2. Uh, I will kind of flip through these. But as you increase your intake of K2, calcification of your arteries goes down or your aorta, and cardiovascular mortality goes down. So just remember K2. This is another study that showed how K2 reduces the incidence of, oh, of uh, cancer in the, in the liver. So it has a multi-effect, a multi really, uh, in many, many ways. And K2 should be... You should think about it because it does work synergistically. What Dr. Kate Rumbleu pointed out is it works synergistically with magnesium. So the magnesium and the K2, they even say if you take high levels of K2, I meant, sorry, of magnesium, you need to make sure you have adequate levels of K2 or you might actually even get a K2 deficiency. So um, you get a reduction in all-cause mortality of 26%. Reduction in coronary artery disease by 57% and calcification by 52%. So you're getting a significant reduction in all of this. I'll skip through. The, well, actually, that's kind of a good one. These are sources. Um, it's actually, I hate to say it, but the richest natural source is if you're living in France and you eat foie gras. You know, that duck goose liver that they force feed, you know, the goose. I don't like it. But anyway, that's the richest natural source of K2. The richest natural source of K1 are leafy, green leafy vegetables. But you're trying to get K2. And so you can get it from dairy products, actually. Hard cheese, eggs, egg yolk at least, and the like. But what we're really facing 
is that these alternative therapies, these things that can keep you out of the hospital in the first place, are being banned. They're being um, really suppressed, like the GCMAF people in, <coughs> if you want, you might write down this uh, website, gcmaf.eu. That's the company's website in uh, Guernsey, on Guernsey. But again, you have these government agencies that have been captured by industry, and they work hand in glove to keep these remedies out of your hands. And that's what we're seeing across the board. It's all about this. It's all about money, as you know. And they don't want the competition. If they can't win in the marketplace, what do they do? The time-honored tradition is to go to the government and say, we need to protect the consumer from these dangerous, untested, unlicensed, horrible products. Oh, yeah, they've been in the diet for thousands, tens of thousands of years, but they're still untested and they're horrible and they're dangerous. And they don't consider their own statistics, like I told you about the vitamins and minerals in the U.S. No one died from a vitamin or mineral supplement. No one. And yet they still put out this disinformation in the media in the print media, and then what we've noticed, especially with National Health Federation, is Wikipedia. I hate Wikipedia. In fact, I refuse to use it. When I do a Google search, and it comes up number one, of course, Wikipedia, I ignore it, and I go to the others. Why? Because of what they did to us years ago. We had a very nice gentleman, our former chairman of the board, who wrote a nice write-up, fairly neutral, about NHF and posted it on Wikipedia. Before we knew it like that, it had been changed to say all sorts of negative things about we're fraudulent. Let's see. Mainstream medical organizations have criticized the NHF for promoting dubious alternative cancer treatments and health claims. The American Cancer Society recommends that cancer patients avoid products promote, well, we don't promote products, by the NHF, while Quackwatch, which, by the way, is a drug industry front group, but Quackwatch describes the NHF as antagonistic to accepted scientific methods as well as to current consumer protection laws. Boy, if you read that, you'll think we're horrible. And uh, so this is what we have to face is this disinformation thrown up against us time after time, and we get this. So that's why I boycott Wikipedia. Oh, and by the way, here's the funny thing. So we go back in. I went back in, tried to change it to the way it was, and within two hours it had been changed right back. Then I do it again. It's been 30 minutes. It didn't take him as long. Change back. I hire an attorney. The attorney goes in and starts changing it think maybe she can succeed. So after about four or five attempts and it keeps getting changed back, uh, she gets a threatening email that says, don't do this anymore. Because what they have, the drug industry has, as you know, I hope you know this, because if you don't, you should, they have these drug industry shills. Do you know what a shill is? They're a shill is sort of this English word about the, someone who goes out. He sort of, s imagine if one of you were sitting there and I say things and then they start saying, oh, that's nonsense. You know, we have, my medical doctor says that, you know, vitamin K2 does nothing and it's just a waste of money. It's expensive urine and so on. And they do that on forums, they do it on blogs, they do it everywhere, and they're paid by the drug industry. And they'll show up on Amazon.com if someone does a review about a book, and then suddenly, here's this guy, our gal, and they're saying some things, and it's real easy for them. They ask one question, and you spend two hours addressing it, thinking you're addressing some reasonable human being, and it's not. They want you to waste your time. They want you to use up your time on that. And they, they pay these guys to go around and sit on these websites, including Wikipedia, just to, to send people away from these cures. Yes. Shills. S-H-I-L-L-S. -S. Shills. Trolls. Yeah, and, sorry, and even in English, too, trolls. They're trolls. And that's skeptics and they couch it in all sorts of language I've had running battles with them and I've had clients get in there and do these and I tell them look it's not worth your time and trouble they're just taking up your time you'll never ever convince them 
uh, move on, and that's it. And that's what we face here. And then even publications, they don't have this in Sweden, I don't think, but it's called Reader's Digest. I used to read it as a kid, even. And so what do they have on the front cover? The vitamin scam, of course. And you read through, and they have 10 vitamins that are a waste of your time and trouble and money, except for vitamin D. Actually, they said something nice about vitamin D. But you know the funny thing? I took this magazine, I bought it, I made this photo myself. I turn it around, and what is there? There's a big drug ad for Prilosec. And then you flip through it, and there are all these drug ads. So of course, you know, they don't want to lose money from the drug industry that's providing all the advertising revenue. So they'll do what they say. So they put this out in the media, and you and I read it. But the reality is, that the only danger in supplements is to the pharmaceutical in industry. That's where the danger is, the disease care business. That's what they are concerned about. They don't want to lose their money. And so supplements undermine this market by keeping you well. So you've got to, I hate to say it after um, the vaccine talk, which I understood was very good. I could see the charts. but. Uh, you want to inoculate yourself against this and your friends and family to say, look, this is the mainstream media talking to protect the profits and their, and their advertising revenue. And so what they do, and I don't know if you know of a gentleman named Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky wrote a book, Manufacturing Consent. He's a left-wing kind of guy, but one of these super honest guys, no matter what his opinion is, left, right, doesn't matter, but he takes a real honest approach, and he co-authored a book called Manufacturing Consent. And it had as its basic premise that the government and the people in power, they go around and they manufacture their own consent. How do they do it? They have speakers come up, they plant stories in the mainstream press, on TV constantly bombarding you with what the story is, and oh, there's a danger, like they did before the war in, in uh, Serbia, Kosovo. You know, oh, there's all these problems there, they're raping, killing, pillaging, these evil Serbians and all of that, and then, so whatever your viewpoint, they, they, they prepare the groundwork, and then what's the, the it's a one-two punch, then you can always anticipate what the second punch is. It's propaganda first, then we take action. And what do we do? Oh, 9-11 or whatever it is. And then we invade Iraq because, of course, the Iraqis you know, attacked New York City or whatever it might be. Or the, wake, the Oklahoma City bombing. They had the Patriot Act in America all prepared, all 1,000 pages of that was introduced the next day. Boy, how did they do that in such a short time? Well, th they've been working on it for quite a long time. This is an American legislation. I won't even bother to explain what it is because it's not pertinent to Sweden. But the point that I want to make is that after all of this being bombarded about how dangerous supplements are and how natural health care is going to hurt you, then they, of course, introduce a legislative solution to the problem. And they do that in Europe, too. They do it everywhere. Canada, you name it, it's done. So you just need to be aware of it. So the basic truth is that these government agencies that are supposed to protect you, they don't protect you. They work for commercial interests. And they're a tool for eliminating cons uh, competition. The only time they really act in your interest is when intense pressure is put on them and they um, will then act for a short period of time in your favor. Now, just giving as an example, and I'll move on very quickly, the FDA in America, totally controlled by the drug industry, and you have people like Margaret Miller and Michael Taylor who worked for um, the FDA and Monsanto, and then it's like they have this revolving drug uh, door, that <laughs> drug, uh, work for this Michael Taylor's trail. Monsanto, then he worked for the FDA. He's a lawyer. He worked for a law firm that had as its major client Monsanto, then back to the FDA, then USDA. That's the way it works. And so a lot of these people, they know, even if they aren't taking money directly, they know they have a job after they leave the FDA. And it's that way with most government agencies. They know they have a job with the drug industry. So rather than have it operate on country by country level, why not have it operate at a global level? A lot less work, right? 
lot less work. So here we have Codex. And now you heard Sarah's explanation about it. So I was very glad she already laid the groundwork. And I saw that she gave you some detail on it. But how many of you still don't feel you know what Codex is? Any, anyone? Okay. So more about this? Okay. I'll kind of go through this quickly. But it was, and Sarah already said this, created in 1963 under the auspices of the Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Health Organization. And so it's about 52 years old now, younger than NHF, but, you know, we uh, will still deal with them. And its main purpose is to, well, it, its stated purpose is to harmonize and standardize international food regulations to eliminate international barriers to trade but these are the stated goals versus the actual goals. And what we've seen over the years of attending NHF, attending these meetings, is that uh, it's, it's captured. We, s we go to the meetings and we see Monsanto. They have their little front group called uh, Crop Life. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But it's an elitist, top-down driven agenda very anti-natural foods and supplements. When I go there and I pull a packet of supplements out to take with my meals, they see it, they can't help but laugh. Meanwhile, they're drinking their diet Coca-Cola that has aspartame in it, and I'm going, ha, ha. But anyway, we, <laughs> you know, you get uh, whatever, but that's the way it seems to work. But the m one of the main problems with Codex is just institutional, that is, it's so slow, as Sarah mentioned, the eight-step process, and it's so slow at arriving at that that by the time they arrive at it, you know, the science has changed and accelerated. You know, the doubling time of knowledge is logarithmic. It goes up. So by the time they get their little standard out, it's already out of date. They're using outdated information. I point this out to them at these meetings time after time. And so... These are the meetings that I kind of go to. The Codex Alimentarius Commission is the next one I'll go to in July, and it's the parent body, but it has like 27 committees doing its work because the commission itself can't, it's, there's too much work out there. And so there are 27 committees, and some people will tell you or talk to you like they know what Codex is about uh, how it's monolithic, or they talk about legislation or things like that, but it's not. Imagine a, f a freeway, an auto route, and there are all these cars going. Some have left their destination hours ago, and they've already arrived, at, I mean, left their starting point, and they've already arrived at their destination. Others are midstream there. Others, maybe they're still packing their bags and getting ready to get into their car. That's like Codex creating these standards and these guidelines. Some have been in place for 20 years. Others are just in the imagination. Others are in the process, and that's what they do. And then they have these working groups that work on them. And we attend as many of these as we can. But the problem is often the members, the people who go there, are nutritionally ignorant country uh, bureaucrats, you know, from Albania to Zimbabwe. And they go to these meetings and so, sort of just imagine us here. So the Codex staff is at the front and the chairman or the chairwoman is here. <coughs> They're the countries and they arrange them alphabetically. And then at the back are the INGOs, the International Non-Governmental Organizations. These are groups like, I was mentioning Crop Life, which is the Monsanto Front Group. It's the Calorie Control Council. Another nice name, huh? Well, that's the aspartame people. The International Food Additives Council. Sounds great, but they represent like the aluminum industry that wants to put aluminum in food and things of that sort. I've had big arguments with them. And I would say clearly 95 to 98% of the INGOs that attend are with uh, the food industry in some shape, form, or fashion. Keep in mind, Codex Aliment Alimentarius is only about food and drink. That's what its name means in Latin. Codex, code, Alimentarius, food, food, code. And so there are like five consumer groups there. Four are anti-supplement, and then there's one that isn't and that's NHF. We're the only ones there fighting f for your right to take supplements and so on. And we've maintained our credibility and our integrity there because we aren't a front group for supplement companies. We'd, 
we don't do that. It's because our consumers, our consumer members want them that we are there protecting them. And actually we do, if I may say so, and it sounds a little bit by about like bragging, but we do a better job than the, there are two of the industry groups that are there for the uh, supplement industry and they do an awful job. They actually support restrictions on supplements. They actually came up to our table once when we were arguing against uh, limits on the maximum upper permitted levels for vitamins. They wanted them real low and they actually came up and screamed at us at our table saying, you're ruining everything. Stop what you're doing. You shouldn't argue against this because they want to sell their little Fred Flintstone vitamins that are real weak but with no barriers throughout the world and they don't care about really helping people. It's just about selling, more. they could be selling chairs, it wouldn't matter if they could make money off of it. Cables, they could be selling cables, it doesn't matter to them. It's not about making people better or anything like that. So when we were arguing that you need therapeutic levels of vitamins and minerals, they were seeing that we were raining on their parade. We were making life difficult for them because something might happen. So they came up and yelled at us. But that's what's going on here. Then there's the Codex staff. And believe it or not, some of the Codex staff is actually sympathetic to what we have to say. They're actually kind of supporters of NHF. Because at these meetings, NHF talks really differently than any of the other groups. You know, from Nor we had the Norwegian delegate come up to us once came up to me once afterwards and said, oh, I thank you so much for se speaking the way you did because I have to be diplomatic. I can't, because I just finished saying, you know, this is all about making money. That's all they're interested in. You talk about consumer safety, but it's really they just want to protect their, their income. And so the Norwegian delegate came up later and said, oh, thank you, because I couldn't say that. And this is what what we do there and so a lot of times they're so afraid to hear what comes out of our mouths the Iranian delegate told us at a recent meeting uh, you know everyone in this room hates you uh, hates NHF well why is that well because every time you open your mouth you cost them money so they don't like that you know you open your mouth you cost them money and so we go to these meetings and um, uh, obviously, we aren't at the to top of the social calendar with these people. This is the FAA headquarters in Rome. That's where the commission meets. Uh, sometimes it meets there. Sometimes it meets in Geneva. And this is what the inside of the room, at least in the FAO building, looks like. It's actually not a great meeting room. It's very uh, crowded. And by the way, up here they have all sorts of like New World Order kind of things with spinning planets and stuff like that. I, for someone who's into that, that might be an interesting study someday to see it. But it's all based on junk science. You know, they give it fancy names like risk assessment, risk analysis, risk management. But when you look at it, it's really they're taking a toxicological model. They're thinking drugs, 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 and they're applying them to natural products. You don't do that. And this is the problem with Europe versus the U.S. on supplements. I have to say, I love Europe. I live in Europe. Um, but they think of vitamins and supplements as drugs. Oh, you've got to test them. And then they try to tell you, what's wrong with that? Why can't we do that? If they're so safe, why can't we subject them to drug tests and all of that? Well, I'll tell you why you don't do it. One, it's unnecessary. And two you scare away a lot of the manufacturing that would make all these innovative supplements that will help people at higher levels. And the third reason is you price them out of the hands of the ordinary consumer, especially poor people who need them the most, you know, who need these. For example, I take my vitamin D that I take, 5,000 international units a day, probably cost me, what's the exchange rate for Kroner here? Eight to one dollar? Something like that? Okay. 8 to 1. So it probably costs me each month 16 kroner to take 5,000 international units a day. 16 kroner. I was giving a speech in Finland and I went to see, oh, how much would it cost me? And it's one little pill. I take one little pill, 16 kroner a month, not a day, to take that. And uh, high quality, excellent quality. No one's ever died from it, gotten even sick from it that I know of. So I go to uh, Helsinki and I go to a local health food store the day of my speech and I look around. I can't find 
5,000 international units. I literally have to take about this much each day, all these little pills. So how much does it cost me? Let's see. Uh, 56. So that would cost me each month about 450 kroner a month to take. 450 kroner versus 16 kroner. And when you have this free medical system and you can't talk about the benefits of vitamin, your doctor won't tell you, you can't put it in a, you know, with, your, with the literature that tells you the benefits of taking vitamin D3. So most of the Swedish population, what are they going to do? They'll listen to their doctor. They'll go get their free flu shot. They'll go take the drugs all of that instead of doing the simple easy thing that will keep them healthier, living longer and all of that. That's what's wrong with it. People think that regulations are harmless. They aren't. They come with a cost. People think, so, so to protect zero people from dying over 35 years, they're increasing the cost of the product so where poor people can't afford it. Even middle in income people have a hard time. You have to make a choice and then you go and you want to get vitamin D3, but it doesn't stop there. You also need vitamin E, K2, all of that. Before long, you're spending all your money on supplements. That's one of the few remaining, there's a lot wrong with America, but one of the few remaining things that's good about America is you can get vitamins fairly inexpensively, and, and they're just as good quality. In fact, the quality of what I was taking in America versus the, d the, the Finnish one it was probably superior in America, yes. Well, it depends on the country. I think there's a company called iHerb.com, and you can order from them. There's an international shipping rate, but they will ship to, like, the UK for sure and Ireland. I know they're blocked in Belgium and maybe Germany, but I don't think they're blocked in Sweden. And you can... Up until now, they haven't been. They haven't. down the border. Well, that's why I love this idea of the uh, the Holso uh, party, you know, whatever it is, the health party, because here Norway isn't part of the European Union, and there aren't that many people in Norway. Why not all of us concentrate our energy on taking over Norway, getting pro-health legislation passed? It can become the oasis for Europe. Then, then you have it better than America with all these inexpensive vitamins, all inexpensive natural care, and you, you conquer the world. <laughs> Take over, concentrate on Norway. What, it only has seven, eight million people? How many people in Norway? Three people? I don't know. Five million. Okay. Well, f somewhere between three and five million people. Yeah, uh, five million people. And so you get this health party to take it over, get good legislation there. And you have vitamins that are freely available, or at least people can come here more easily than America. I mean, that should be one project to do. And then you have the GCMAF people move there from Guernsey. And before you know it, uh, there's a lot more health. Yes, Angelica. Is there any uh, significant difference between Canada and America? Uh, Canada's gone the path of the devil, unfortunately. So it, there's a law called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which we called DSHEA, that was passed uh, 21 years ago. Thanks in part to the NHF, but also other groups deserve credit. And actually industry at the time deserved credit because they were more, at that time, they were more populated by people like us who were interested in actually making people well. Now you see a lot of drug companies that are buying up these supplement companies, and uh, so it's a little bit less. But there's this law that protects supplements in the U.S., but all it takes is one vote in Congress to overturn that law. Yes? She brought the... Oh, Gibraltar. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the British Crown clamped down on the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, Gibraltar, and all of that as, and they use this as an excuse, these tax refuge, you know, refuges. And because I spent a lot of time studying the Isle of Man, I almost moved there, actually, in the 90s. Um, but I was a troublemaker, and so they wouldn't let me in. But anyway, that's a whole other story. The uh, but Gibraltar, it's the same thing. They're clamping down on it, and yeah, 
You can, but there's a problem there because Spanish claims on Gibraltar and they s sometimes block the border. Sometimes you can't get the mail for a, a month. We, yeah, we have uh, one of our NHF representatives for Gibraltar is a very um, savvy woman who's lived there for most, well, I don't know about most of her life, but at least the last 20 years. And um, she's advised us of a lot of the problems there. I've never been there, so I don't know as much as you do. But I do rely on what she said. She was at our NHF UK event a month ago, and we talked about it and all of that because we had, we had actually contemplated an idea very similar to this. But I think you take over Norway and conquer the world. I mean, that's <laughs> really where it's at. So, um, but anyway, they have all these different standards. They have you know, the vitamin mineral food st standards, the GM uh, uh, food labeling, aspartame, aluminum. I'll talk a little bit about this more, so I don't want to run out of time. I don't know how much time we have. So we speak out at Codex. We're very lucky because we lucked out getting a seat. I was on the U.S. delegation for two years, and they kicked me off because I was a, oh wait, what's that word? Troublemaker. And so they kicked me off, but we did... Uh, yeah, okay. So we were able to get aluminum out of food additives in about 50% of the food. With the help, actually, of the EU representatives, antibiotics in our food, we were able to eliminate 9 out of 10 that go into animal food. Melamine, we had a huge victory from being just the only voice at Codex to say, hey, you shouldn't have melamine. You know what melamine is, right? It's what poisoned cats and dogs and babies and infant formula years ago because some clever little Chinese guy realized, hey, when they test the protein content in infant formula and cat and dog food, they just test for nitrogen levels. Well, guess what? Melamine is super rich in, in nitrogen, plus it costs a fraction of the price of uh, protein. So let's just add that in. They'll never catch us. We'll add that in. And then when they test it, oh, yeah, you have 27% protein level. Good. We're, we're accepting the product. Fed it. It killed about 100, 150,000 cats and dogs in North America when they ate the, the dog food or the cat food. And infant babies were, well, babies were, of course, they're infant. Babies were much tougher. It only killed about 100 or so of them, but it sickened about 5,000 in the infant formula. So they wanted, industry wanted, an exemption, a sky's the limit exemption, an infant formula, dry infant formula for melamine. So I go to this meeting, it's a Codex Committee on uh, Contaminants in Food, and I, th I hear this announced, plus they wanted a high level normally, and I raise m my hand to speak for NHF because no one else is speaking. I'm thinking, where am I, on the moon or something? And, and I say, there should be zero tolerance. There should be nothing. Babies are very defenseless against this and there should be zero tolerance they all look at me like I'm the man on the moon you know I'm like some weird person so I went from being the only one and persisting to two and a half years later we had a hundred percent total victory in our side where we eliminated that exemption in infant formula now they still can have a very low level but it's not like the sky's the limit. And that was all due to NHF, and that was due to, thank you, that was due to us speaking out at the meeting. So we've made a difference. I know I've seen it happen. And this is the chairman. He was in favor of having the exemption, and then at the end he was uh, against it. So anyway. And the same with nutrient reference values. In 2009, they wanted to lower down by 20 to 66% the levels, the recommended daily allowance, and this is what most consumers look at. They don't know that 60 milligrams of vitamin C a day is totally inadequate, but they wanted to lower it down to 45 milligrams a day. It was already ridiculous. You smoke two cigarettes a day and you've destroyed 60 milligrams, maybe even just one cigarette. So... <coughs> I spoke up at the meeting. No one, again, no one was speaking out except meek little Costa Rica said, oh, vitamin A shouldn't be lowered. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Sat down. And that's it. So then I started arguing, and we had an argument, an ongoing debate, just me against the world for about an hour against Australia, all of these others. There were only two delegates, two countries who spoke up in my favor. One was Iraq. 
believe it or not, because I'd befriended him at the lunch break. And then the Indian delegate at a very strategic time, we said, we support NHF. These should be held back for study. Otherwise, they would have gone through. They would have sailed through. And uh, they, they would have done this all down. And what happened is uh, we've been fighting it for five years. Um, in any event, they, um, we were able to stop it. And then just last November, we had a victory with vitamin C. We were actually, and this was actually thanks to the EU as, as much as to us at this particular stage, we increased the level from 60 to 100 milligrams a day. Now, it's not what we wanted. It's not what people should take. But we totally reversed the energy from where they were going to have it at 45 milligrams a day to 100. So we had that victory. And we're still fighting on magnesium. We'll deal with it in November in Germany and the like. But the real battle, and I just came back three weeks ago from Costa Rica where there was a big battle on recombinant bovine growth hormone. This is that genetically modified uh, hormone where they inject into cattle to increase milk production. In the US, it's not, al it's not allowed in Sweden. Don't worry, if you have Swedish milk or EU milk, it's not allowed. But if you go to America, it is. Canada, they w Monsanto was caught, it's a Monsanto drug, of course, caught with its hand in the cookie jar bribing three Canadian Health uh, Canada officials, their equivalent of FDA, and so, and then a friend of NHF called, named Robert Cohen had gotten documentation to Health Canada, so they, they blocked it in Canada. But otherwise, the rest of the Western Hemisphere, they've, they've carried it on. Now, why is this important? Well, you need to be thankful to the EU representatives there and your own Swedish delegate, Codex delegate, because they fight very hard to keep this out of the EU. And I know a lot of these people personally. I've seen them. I've worked with them. So I know it's coming from the heart. It's not just a day job for them. So they're actually, I'm not always going to say this about them on other issues, but on this issue and aluminum, they are really wonderful. And so at this meeting in Costa Rica and San Jose, Costa Rica, they were arguing very diligently against RBST, it's called, or RBGH, because at Codex, it's sitting there, and this is why Codex is important to each and every one of you. For 16 years, the standard of maximum residue level was sitting in limbo uh, where it wasn't being acted on, but at the final step eight, I mean, it was like on the verge of being adopted when it was stopped, and it sh never should have gotten to that step eight. And so now it's been brought up again in this committee, and they wanted to get a recommendation, and the science officer for Codex, it's called JEGFA, a woman named Angelica, also Angelica, uh, Trisher, who's the science officer, is saying, well, we've studied it, and it's completely safe. It doesn't cause an increase in mastitis, which is, um, which is a udder infection. You know, the cows, let me see if this has, yeah. Um, the, uh, it doesn't have an udder infection, and or cause an increase in that. And no problem with IGF-1 production, Ig insulin-like growth factor we've documented shows cancer increase. Long story made short, because otherwise I won't be able to tell with these people waiting here to whisk me away. Um, so she's saying this, saying the EU, your science is all wrong. You can't block this because it's very healthy. The US is saying, yay, yay, Codex. You know, this is exactly right. Argentina, Brazil, you name it. Almost all these African countries are saying the same thing, and it's the EU and India against the world, and NHF against the world. But I had found some documentation, and I said, well, Miss uh, Jegfa Secretariat, if it's so safe, how, and you did such extensive research, then why did you miss Monsanto's own data that shows a 79% increase in mastitis? Why does it say on their own label, their warning label for their drug product, may cause an increase in mastitis? What's your answer to that? And she didn't have an answer. And then afterwards, I'm getting like these emails from Brussels from the Codex office saying, thank you, you're our hero for saying that. Because we pointed out that they didn't have extensive science on it. But it, the battle is still going on. But this is the problem with Codex is they genuflect 
at the altar of Codex. And the problem is that if they succeed, if they get a maximum residue level at Codex for that, and this is the important thing that you know, need to know to understand how the process works. They get that level at Codex, and then the U.S. government or the Brazilian government or the Argentinian government can go to the World Trade Organization and say, um, we want these products in the EU and they're blocking them. And we want a trade sanction against all these kinds, Sweden and Ireland and, uh, and Finland and Germany because they're engaging in an unfair trade practice. And then the WTO arbitration panel will say, well, why is that? What's unfair about it? Oh, there's a codex standard that says if you have this level of the residue in the milk product, then there's no problem. So then the WTO will go to the EU and say, hey, there's a codex standard. You have to let it in. And if the EU, as they have with GMO products, if they block it, then they will get fined. And you will have to pay through taxes to pay money to the U.S. government, the Brazilian government, because the EU is engaging in an unfair trade practice that's blocking you from having this drug in your milk products. That's why it's important at Codex to stop it and that's why the work we do there is so vital. So the support that you give to, and, and I won't finish my slides because... <laughs> you are really out here. I'm really <laughs> out of, oh. Is so important because you're helping through NHF Sweden to put us there to be speaking out and to do this. And I give an example, one guy who contributed $1,000 uh, to send me to Dusseldorf that time five years ago, six years ago, where I was able to stop the NRVs. So your contributions, even buying the book, <laughs> even you know buying these magazines, helps to send us to these Codex meetings and do this work that will help protect you and your families and to do stuff in the future. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay, we thank you so okay. much. Thank you. <laughs>